Hey everyone, this is Nick, and today I'm going to annoy a lot of people by stating what should be obvious. Flatpak is the future of Linux application distribution, whether people like it or not. And I know some of you prefer the good old devs and RPMs, and some prefer app images, and someone somewhere prefers snaps. And sure, Flatpak is not perfect, but it is slowly but surely winning this contest of application distribution and packaging formats. And this video is here to explain why. Just like I'm going to explain why this video is sponsored by today's sponsor. Linode is an amazing way to get your Linux server up and running. They've been voted top provider for infrastructure as a service by G2 and Trustradius, and they offer tons of one-click deployable servers. For example, Owncast, letting you run your own Twitch-like streaming server with video broadcast and chat capabilities, or Apache Guacamole, which is the easiest way to get your own fully featured Linux desktop in the cloud, accessible from anywhere in the world. If you prefer gaming, you can also start your own Valheim server on Linode, and they also have one-click servers available for CSGO, Rust, Arc, or Minecraft, among others. Now, on top of that, Linode is currently upgrading all their data centers with faster NVMe block storage, which means that every server that you currently have with them or that you plan to open with them will have access to that faster storage at no extra cost for you, which is pretty freaking amazing. Now, I personally run my own Nextcloud instance and only Office document server, both on Linode, and I couldn't be more satisfied. I can only recommend them. So if you want to give them a shot and get started, click the link in the description below and you will get a free $100 credit to start your own Linux server. So Flatpak was created a while ago, in 2007, although it only became Flatpak and more popular starting in 2016. Its main goal was to solve the many, many issues that traditional packaging formats faced. Or at least the issues that people maintaining, packaging, updating and upgrading these packages faced every day. What are these issues, you say? Why can't we stick to the good old devs and RPMs? Well, first, there's the dependency hell. You might have recently seen one example of that through the Linus Tech Tips Challenge. Installing Steam removed the desktop environment entirely. Now sure, Linus had to input something to confirm, but how messed up these dependencies had to be to think that someone wanting to install a graphical app would want to remove their graphical desktop and x.org. That's an extreme example. But other occurrences, although sometimes smaller, happen all the time. Sometimes it's just auto-remove that nukes the packages that you still need it. Sometimes it's a cascade. You uninstall a package and something goes wrong and a meta package gets removed and everything else gets nuked. Sometimes it's just an upgrade that goes wrong because it can't find the dependency it needs. These are basic issues with packages. And believe me, even if you specifically didn't encounter any, a lot of people have over the years. I started using Linux in 2006. It happened back then and it still happens now. Second problem is application distribution. These good old packages need to be made for every distro, for every release, for every architecture. This means, for example, for a web browser that you need to package it for Debian, for Ubuntu because they don't necessarily have full compatibility, for Fedora, for OpenSUSE, maybe Arch if you want. Multiply that by every current version of these OSs that are supported. And that again, by every CPU architecture that these OS supports. Just dealing with Ubuntu alone will net you with tens of packages that you have to update, to maintain, to upgrade for each release every time you push an update to your app. And sure, you can automate all of that, but as everything automated, sometimes it fails and you're going to waste a ton of time trying to fix these various issues and restore the automation that just stopped working. And then you have to store all these packages somewhere and distros generally don't accept new packages very often or very quickly, which means that you have to host your own PPA somewhere. Now, speaking of PPAs or external repositories, they introduce more dependency hell as they can contain library updates that might break other applications that don't come from this repo or PPA. They also have a tendency to make in-place upgrades fail. This distribution problem makes it virtually impossible for third-party developers to support Linux in any meaningful way. Take Adobe, for example. If they were to port Photoshop for Linux, they would have to make packages for a ton of distributions if they wanted to satisfy everyone, which means that they would probably only make a dev for Ubuntu, let's be honest. The final point is the retro compatibility. Since your libraries are shared by the system, 
it can be very hard to keep all the versions of these libraries for all the programs, which also means that you basically can't run very old graphical user interface programs on newer Linux distros, unless the distro takes an enormous amount of time to package everything, including super old libraries that conflict with newer ones. Oh, and there's the fact that installing a package is super insecure during the install process, because that package can do anything it wants. It has full root access during the install process. So you better trust that repo that you just added. Oh, and there's also the fact that maintaining and upgrading these packages is such a chore that some distros elect to just fix the base in place in terms of applications and new features. That's how you end up with LTS releases that have up to two years old versions of applications that never got feature updates. They do get security updates, but yeah, they don't really give you the latest apps at all because that's too complex. Okay, so at this point, we have established that these good old packages are old, but not so good at least for distributing applications for system libraries and the distros base, they're fine. So why is Flatpak any better? First, Flatpak is universal. This means that you can install the same package on any distro that has the Flatpak base installed, which is mostly everyone but Ubuntu these days. Developers package once and distribute everywhere on any distro, any version, any library, whether you use systemd or not. That's even a better deal than what Windows or macOS has because these still have to have different executables for different versions of Windows or macOS. With Flatpak, you package once and you hit every version of every distro, even the ones that aren't released yet. And since you don't have to spend all that time maintaining these packages and upgrading them and maintaining your repo, you have plenty of time to make your app better or catch up on your favorite hentai, an anime, catch up on your favorite anime. Second, Flatpak doesn't require root to install. This means that the apps you install can't use elevated permissions to install anything without you knowing, or modify your system's config, or do anything problematic. Well, at least during the install. Once you open the app, it can have permissions, which can access these things if you enter your password. But during the install, they're perfectly safe. And after the install, they're just as safe, if not more so, than the apps you would have installed with regular old packages. Flatpak apps are sandboxed. The sandbox isn't perfect, but it's still miles ahead of no sandboxing at all. And the various things that happen outside of the sandbox are slowly being replaced by access to portals, which are ways to access the system without the app receiving anything that you, the user, didn't choose. For example, with the file chooser portal, an application just doesn't have access to your user directories. When it needs to open a file, it tells the file chooser portal that it needs something. This file chooser opens a file picker window, you pick your file, and only that file is passed to the application that requested it. The app never saw anything in your folders, and that's for the better because I know what's in there, you dirty bastard. All these permissions are managed by the user, and they can choose to disable them either in their desktop environment settings or through a third-party app called Flatseal. Flatpak is also decentralized. Anyone can host their own Flatpak remote, which is the equivalent to a repository and anyone can have access to Flathub, the biggest of these remotes. For example, Fedora has their own remote, just like Elementary OS, and both of these don't include Flathub by default. This means that you don't have to wait for distributions to accept your package, which can take years. You just upload to Flathub, or if you really want your own remote, you can create it, and it has zero chance of breaking the user's system. Flatpak also integrates with your desktop and app store. You can install apps directly from GNOME Software, Discover, PAMAC, the App Center, and more. You can then manage them from here. They'll add menu entries, they'll work with the dock or the taskbar, they're just normal citizens. Now there are still issues like handling of system-wide dark mode or supporting certain themes that aren't in Flathub's theme remote, but these issues are being worked on. Some people will say that Flatpak isn't space efficient, but that's not really true. Flatpak ships libraries as runtimes, and these get reused by the various apps that need them. This means that your first Flatpak will definitely use more space than if you install the same app through the regular packages. But future apps that use the same runtimes will wait just the same as a packaged version of the same app. These runtimes have also been accused of using more RAM, but they don't use more RAM than if you had loaded the corresponding libraries if they were installed as packages. So, all in all, Flatpak brings a ton of advantages over the good old packages like devs or RPMs. 
But there are other modern software distribution methods like AppImage and Snap. So why not these? So let's start with Snap. Snap will never be a favorite for most people. It's made by Canonical, which a lot of people seem to hate for reasons that escape me. Snap also has a proprietary store backend, which annoys a lot of people. And it has clearly been designed for server and IoT first and desktop second. This means that it's slow to start, which is not an issue for server stuff, but pretty frustrating for desktop applications. It doesn't really integrate well with your desktop with theme issues. And the Snap Store generally doesn't have as many available applications as Flathub, at least from my personal perception. There's also app images. These are self-contained, as in each app carries all the libraries they need to run. There's no run times here. They're portable. You can drop them into a folder somewhere and take them from distro to distro and they will run anywhere. Super handy. Except that this takes a lot more space than the approach Flatpak went with, because there are no reuse of common components. And these app images generally look completely out of place with the rest of your system. They're not following your theme or dark mode, not even adding shortcuts in your menu unless you also have an app image helper installed, which a lot of distros do not have. App images are cool, but they're not super friendly, which means that you have a choice with antiquated packages and all the dependency and distribution issues they have, snaps which no one really likes, or Flatpak. No wonder Flatpak is winning. I know there is a blog post somewhere stating that Flatpak is not the future, and I linked it in the description below if you want to read that as well. I mostly think that this blog post is yelling at Clouds about how he wants software to stay distributed like it was in the olden days and and maybe even go to the Windows distribution of software method, like downloading EXE from websites, which is horrible, insecure, inconvenient, and stupid. But there are still some interesting issues that he puts up in his blog post, especially the fact that sandboxing makes people feel like it's super secure, although it's not really because depending on the permissions, this app can escape the sandbox. In the end though, what matters is what distros start shipping. And most of them are not turning to Snap or to app images. They're turning to Flatpak because a lot of them want an out from the old packages that put a huge burden on them in terms of time to maintain, update, test, upgrade, and generally fix all the dependency hell. I'm pretty certain that those good old packages will not disappear anytime soon. Don't worry, they'll still be there because they still have a real good use for making a system base for the distribution and a lot of people will just want to keep using those. But for the general public and the distros that aim for that general public, Flatpak is winning and Flatpak is the future. It might not be perfect, but it's better than all other alternatives that we have right now. So this video was made possible by Slimbook and if you don't know who they are, they're based in Valencia, Spain and they make Linux laptops, Linux desktops from all form factors, from the smallest NUC to the biggest all-in-one desktop, including gaming laptops and stuff like that. I only use their stuff nowadays, their desktop, their laptop, their keyboard. It's great. I left a link in the description below. Just click it if you need a new Linux device. I can only recommend them. So thank you guys for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, subscribe, turn on notifications, whatever else YouTube requires for you to get these videos in your feed. And if you didn't like the video, you can dislike and tell me why Flatpak is horrible in the comments and how I'm super wrong. And if you like the video and you want to help me make more of these, you can also join my Patreon subscribers and my YouTube members. Any one of these have the same benefits, a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So links in the description. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.